All right, so I'm working on my course, Investment Basics 101, and, um, and I'm just doing a lot of reading for it. So I bust out some of the old books, Random Walk Down Wall Street by Burton Malkiel. Uh, we've got uh, One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. See my notes in there. I got my Vogel books, of course. Uh, Charles Ellis, uh, Story of Long-Term Investment invest Excellence on the cap American Funds, essentially. Um, and I'm very much enjoying this book. And I got just, you know, investment books at the wazoo. And um, everyone has a different take on it. I, I'm just reading this right now. And one of the things that was interesting to me is, he says, rising industry concentration was associated with higher pay for executives, a decline in workers' bargaining power, and a falling investment in research and development. All right. Economists at the NBER, National Bureau of Economic Research, found that while low interest rates have traditionally been viewed as a positive for economic growth, extremely low interest rates may lead to lower growth by increasing market concentration. I get, I, what this simply means is the wealthier are getting wealthier and all of us are holding the wet back. All right. It's pretty interesting. And they go on to, uh, uh, it's guaranteed that with low interest rates, eco ec economy-wide measures of market concentration will rise and aggregate prog productivity growth will fall. I thought that was pretty interesting. But that's even more interesting right here. All right. So basically, in the name of shareholder value, senior executives were handed free stock options, other equity-linked incentives. Now they have skin in the game. Management interests were aligned with those of shareholders. Under President Roosevelt's New Deal, it was illegal for companies to acquire their shares in the open market, this being regarded as a form of stock manipulation. But this law was repealed in 1982 at around the date when interest rates embarked on their multi-decade decline. Under the mantra of shareholder value, managements were encouraged to replace expensive equity with cheap labor. Anyway, the point being is... So I'm reading that, I'm like, oh, maybe that's the impetus uh, of the massive amounts of stock market growth in 1982 under Reagan. And it occurred in, in, under Clinton and occurred under Obama, too. I said maybe the impetus was getting rid of, almost like you can actually pinpoint uh, the, the getting rid of mark-to-market -market accounting, which allowed us to crawl out from the depths of the Great Recession. That, that's just a fact, dude. Getting, Barney Frank saved capitalism. I did a video on that before by saying, we got to get rid of mark-to-market -market accounting, and I'm not going to get that here. And I said, I wonder if you can do the same thing in 1982, Is that the pinpoint of this massive growth of equities. So I started doing some research, and I started looking at my man Colbert's spreadsheets, 55e.co, and I'll put a link in the show notes. You can buy it. I think it's like 20 35 bucks or something like that. It's freaking fantastic, dude. And I said, what happens if in every 30-year increments, all right, because in a, a retirement frame should be looked at 30 years. I mean, you might not last long, I get that, but I think 30 years is most people say, yeah, that's, that's the same. 25 to 30 years is what you should look at. Now, the interesting thing is I, we only have five unique 30-year time frames since the, basically the dawn of the modern stock market. And I hate to even say the modern because in 1871, was it really modern? But it doesn't matter. We have numbers for that. So we only have really five unique 30-year time frames. All right. And so the, the idea would be is that the markets were basically lagging, lagging, lagging until 1982. And then they took off like a bat out of hell because Reagan got rid of the FDR thing. If we're going to pinpoint it like we did mark-to-market -market accounting, being the, uh, getting rid of that to, to solve the great financial uh, crisis. Ironically, that's not what happened. So we're going to show you. So I just used Daniel Colbert. So I went from 1871 to 1900. That's one time. 1901, 1930. That's a second. 1931, 1960. 1961 to 1990. And 1991 to 2020. So we have five unique time frames. That's not enough N uh, to be statistically relevant, by the way. We don't know. But we, we still can go back 160 years or something like that. 50 years, I guess. From 1871 to 1900, the S&P 500 grew at a clip of 6.95% a year. And that was during massive deflation. So let me show you. It's crazy, actually. We've got 1871 to 1900. Here's the inflation. Look at that, dude. From 1871 to 1900. Massive deflation. All right. So while this right here may seem not very good, when you actually look at the massive deflation, and I haven't done that, but I should chart that out, too. I haven't done it here today. That's a whole different ballgame, is it not? Yes, it is, because there's massive amounts of deflation. Now, check this out. 
From 1901 to 1930, the markets grew at 8.28% a year. You know, 1901 to 1930, we're going to see, other than World War II and the beginning of the 1900s, we're going to see pretty big deflation as well. We got, you know, it's actually interesting. This they didn't really have CPI back then, but they had the BLS was still conducting numbers on cost of living. And we have, and when I talk about my new book, I talk about how everyone's like, oh my goodness, the cost of living is going through the roof. Not relative to what we've come to expect in inflationary times here in the 70s and last year, of course. But then World War I kicked in. You got massive inflation. All right. And then, of course, in the 1920s, after what you got some deflation, getting rid of the World War I excess. And then we got pretty, you know, pretty moderate growth in the inflation numbers in 1920s. All right, let's keep going. 1931 and 1960, the market averaged 10.313. 1961 to 1990, the market averaged 10.19. And then 1991 to 2020, the market averaged uh, 10.71. Again, only five unique circumstances here. So if you go back from 1960, we're going to see from 1931 right here, deflation, 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 moderate inflation, deflation, moderate, and then we have World War II, and then massive inflation after World War II. And again, I write about this in my book. The 1950s were pretty stellar in terms of just moderate inflation. So you can't say it's massive inflation in the 1930 to 1960 time frame. 1960 to 1990 is different, though. 1960... We didn't really get inflation until about 1967, and then it grew, 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 grew until even the 80s. So that's pretty significant inflation from 1960 to 1990. But then 1990 on, you know, it was, it was pretty moderate. So you really, you really can't tie one to the other. Say, wow, inflation, you just can't because we have deflation here. We had a market growing at 69 we had inflation here. We had a market grown to 10.13. What's better? And probably they probably are about the same, is what I'm saying here. Moderate inflation with a, a significant equity growth. This is the best we're going to get right there, in my opinion, 1991 to 2020. You're not going to beat that. But that also encompasses two major bear markets and two major recessions: 2000, 2001 and two, 2007, eight and nine. You know, I mean, so it wasn't all peachy keen. So, you know, you basically here you can knock 3% off for inflation. You, you can't knock anything off here for inflation. So negative infl net of inflation, this is a little bit better than this, but not by much. Anyway, the point being is there's no way to say what market did better during inflation. We just don't know. We don't know. Now, there's more participants in the market than there was in 1871. I'll grant you that. But, I mean, still we've got a huge amount of people aren't participating in the market still, even today. And we got certainly more, I, I actually can't say that. You can't say the wealth is a consolidated any more now than it was in the 1910s with the freaking robber barons and stuff. You can say the wealth is more consolidated now than it was probably in the 1950s. I haven't done the research on that. I haven't, but okay. There probably is something to be said about that. But you certainly can't say it's more consolidated than it was back in these days. When you had, again, you had the, the freaking barons of the industry, you had titans of industry, all those scumbags who were manipulating the data. J.P. Morgan, you know, that's, why do you think they sh they sunk the Titanic, dude? Um, no, they, there's no evidence. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you think J.P. Morgan and those guys wanted the Titanic to be sunk? Yeah, yes, there is. Lots of evidence on that. In fact, it's funny. You look at the debunkers, like, there isn't any evidence. You're like... Did you actually read your own debunking thing? Because the evidence is your debunking is, is easy to do debunk. Anyway, so I don't know what's going to show up. I don't know. And that's the concern. It's like we all want, we, it's easy to fall for the idea that the markets is going to, because of massive amounts of spending, massive amounts of debt, that the, and the fact that you have less and less participants. I, when I mean participants in terms of it's consolidated more and more greatly at a, at a select few. But it's kind of always been like that. And um, and you have more participants now. More people put in 401ks. So I, I don't know the answer is. But I just it's easy to fall suspect to the negativity. And I do. And it's just like, you know, at the end of the day, where else are you going to go? Now you got good government bonds paying decent yields. So that's a good place. That's why I'm heavy in government bonds right now. Because I'm getting 6% on Federal Home Loan Bank. But... You know, I'm not going to be there forever. I thought it might be called in June. I'm not sure it will be now because it doesn't look like the interest rates are going to cut them anytime soon. But, you know, the 10-year Treasury is still now down, to, again, down to 3.3. Who knows what the hell is going to happen? At the end of the day, you can't control this. 
So you shouldn't have spent a whole lot of time thinking that this is going to happen because of that. It's just, dude, that we don't know. We don't know. And what I'd say is just get, and I was talking to this guy yesterday, he and his wife are crushing in Oklahoma. A good 65, 35 portfolio. They got cash. They got no debt. He's driving a 2007 Toyota Tundra. She's driving a 2015 Toyota Highlander. I'm like shocked, you know, because I always do my videos. You know you're ready to retire. Husband drives a 2007 Ford F-150. Wife drives a 2013 Toyota Camry. And it's just, it's the same old story, dude. Anyway, it's like, what are you going to do? man? He's got 65, 35 portfolio among Fidelity ETFs, no cost. He's got cash. He's got no debt. I mean, there's nothing else to do. See, that's the difference between me, though. I have, I don't have any cash. I don't have debt. See that difference there? You go into retirement with no cash and debt, you can be afford to be a lot more aggressive. And I don't mean to say aggressive, like freaking swinging for the fences, but a good moderate to moderately aggressive portfolio. Absolutely. You go to retirement with debt, no cash. You can't afford that. Just that flat. All right. Love your thoughts, man. Don't forget to subscribe to Doobie Doo. Don't forget, I got my new book out there. Uh, relax and retire. I'll put links to all that in the show notes. Thanks now. And uh, subscribe to Daniel uh, Colbert's stuff, 55e.co.